Good evening, everyone. I'm Rabbi Barry Schwartz, the director of the Jewish Publication Society. I've been asked to make the introduction this evening on behalf of the Jewish Publication Society and the Skirball Institute for Adult Jewish Studies. This is the third in our new partnership between JPS and the Skirball uh, Center. We're very, very delighted at this uh, partnership. And I have to tell you, it's been a, a wonderful two weeks for us because the Jewish Publication Society is concluding now at the end of the year 2013, our 125th year. We are the oldest Jewish uh, publisher in the United States. And we're doing so in a big way with a 10-year, 70-scholar project that has culminated in what we're about to talk about this evening, Outside the Bible, Ancient Jewish Writings Related to Scripture. I don't exaggerate in, in telling you that this was more than a decade-long project with world-class scholars from uh, all over the planet contributing to this first compilation of Second Temple writings from a Jewish perspective. We were uh, delighted two weeks ago this evening to recognize and have speak here Professor James Kugel, one of the three editors for Outside the Bible. And this evening, we are very, very fortunate to have Professor Lawrence Schiffman speaking to us. After this uh, program, you are welcome to take a look at the three volumes, 3,300 pages of Outside uh, the Bible. I wanted to make you aware that there is also a study guide that is a course syllabus for enhancing Torah study with Outside the Bible. Uh, there's a discount that we're offering on this project, and it might make a wonderful gift not only to yourselves, but to your uh, library, synagogue, institutions as well. Uh, Professor Lauren Schiffman was a guiding light in this project. Without his enthusiasm and his support, uh, this project would not have been uh, possible. As Professor Kugel explained and Professor Schiffman will elaborate, we're speaking about the literature of the Jewish people over a four to five century period from the close of the biblical era to the beginning of the Mishnaic period. We're speaking about literature that has been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, what is called the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, Philo, and Josephus. This compilation is opening up a window to a world that is responsible for both the birth of rabbinic Judaism and the birth of early Christianity as well. More than two decades ago, Professor Schiffman published a book with JPS called Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was a landmark book in, as the title suggests, reclaiming the heritage of the scrolls for the Jewish people. And I think the same can be said. This is reclaiming the second temporal literature as ancient Jewish writings written by Jews, for Jews, and of Jews. Rabbi Lon Schiffman is one of the world's foremost scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls and taught at New York University for just short of four decades, is presently both professor and vice provost at Yeshiva University, also here in Manhattan. It's a great honor and privilege for me to welcome Professor Lauren Schiffman. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I want to explain at the outset that our uh, project actually involved a lot of different types of literature that we sought to present as a kind of uniform library. The problem is that generally when we speak of the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Apocrypha, which are books that were found in the Greek Bibles and hence are in the Catholic Bibles, or various other terms that we use for this literature, we're dividing the literature according to where and how we got it. 
as opposed to what it's really like. And so what we did in this project was to create a new classification system according to the literary types of the material. And that will help very much in understanding it as a corpus of the library that would have been there, so to speak, if you were a Second Temple Jew. Despite the fact that we unified it in that manner, I've chosen for this evening to just speak in particular about the issue of biblical interpretation in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And of course, this is because this is my particular specialty, and I never claim that what I do is more important than what other people do, but I do claim that I'm more interested in what I do than what they do. I'll just point out that this cover is actually a beautiful invitation for a wonderful event that took place about a month ago for at the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem, where we opened up an exhibit on the history, as I jokingly call it, of their Bible and our Bible and the dissemination of the Bible, that is, of the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament throughout the world and Western civilization. So if anyone is in Jerusalem it, from now through Pesach, please go to see this thing in the Bible Lands Museum. It's just a wonderful, wonderful exhibit. But in order to actually discuss the subject that we are discussing, I have to see here. Can't be right, can't be left. No more buttons left. Nobody works here. Well, someone's going to have to figure out what to do with this thing over here. Yours truly just figured out. It wasn't on. There we go. Okay. Uh, they, they owe me for the uh, video man, or whatever he is, not the video man, the AV man who walked out. Okay. I don't know if you tell the story, Russ. I once was at a lecture. A man was brought all the way to Melbourne, Australia, from London to give a lecture. And the thing didn't work, the sound. And it was garbled. You couldn't hear a thing because there were two microphones going at once. So I tried to be a nice guy and go find the guy who's been paid to take care of it. I finally found some janitor. He told me he left. So he collected the money, and no one heard the lecture after a guy had flown all the way to Melbourne, and he went home the next day. So at least that didn't happen to us. So I want to begin by pointing out to you that there are represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls all of what we call the Hebrew Scriptures, except the Book of Esther. There are different opinions about why that is. Some think that Esther wasn't there simply because of the fact that it was lost by accident. Others feel that since Purim's not in their calendars, maybe they rejected the festival of Purim also as it's a, uh, basically what we call a rabbinic ordinance to observe Purim. Now, another possibility is the famous question of how come God isn't mentioned in the Megillah, etc. But I show you this so you'll understand why it is that there's so much biblical interpretation in the scrolls. Now, we have to understand that the Bible text in the Dead Sea Scrolls is not exactly the same as the ones we're used to. Because whereas any Chumash you're going to open up, any five books of Moses, or any prophets or writings, no matter what kind of synagogue you go to, it's all the same for us, except there are a few spelling differences. But it's all the same. There isn't any difference. That wasn't the case in Second Temple times. Now, having said that, you shouldn't think that the Bible would have in it things like thou shalt steal or thou shalt commit adultery. Of course not. The Bible is the Bible. But even though the Bible is the Bible, there are a lot of various minor differences, some of which have to do with language or just substitute expressions or even what we call textual corruptions, but some of which represent interpretations. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we used to say that there were three different types of Bible. The Proto-Masoretic, which is the one that represents what became our Torah, Second of all, the Proto-Samaritan, which is a version that is similar to what the Samaritans, that ancient sect that still exists of people who remain from the northern tribes in the first temple period, what they had. And then the third one is the one that was used by the translators of the Greek Bible, the Septuagint. Now this turns out to be, uh, pre to present for us a kind of picture of the history of the Bible that you see in front of you, where basically our, according to this claim, our Bibles come from this recension which somehow or another is Babylonian, whereas the Palestinian one gives us the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the Egyptian is the type of Torah that was used in ancient Egypt. Now this was the theory. Don't write it down as if it's true. 
This was the theory before they really understood all the Bibles and the scrolls. Once you understand all the Bibles and the scrolls, you discover that it's not so simple. First of all, we have a problem of statistics, by which I mean to say that when you actually look at the numbers, you find out that the Proto-Masoretic is the largest group. And that makes sense. That's the Bible that we received and that we use. Mesora, Masoretic, if you remember Fiddler on the Roof, instead of tradition, they sang in Hebrew, Mesora, and in Yiddish, Mesoira. So one way or another, this word means traditional. And that's our traditional Hebrew text. And then we have what they call Vulgar texts, vulgar texts, it's not what you think it is, don't worry. Vulgar texts mean common texts. Common texts are written into a dialect of Hebrew that everybody could understand. They would write the Torah into a dialect it, that, they, that they used. And then we find out that we have so-called sectarian texts, which have a special dialect of Hebrew. And then we have Proto-Masoretic, which we already mentioned. And you have to understand, I just took it on, stuck it down here on the bottom, by the way, that no New Testament was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls because the New Testament was written after the Dead Sea Scrolls were copied. Jesus and John of the Baptist, no matter what you hear on some TV show or read in the National Enquirer or some other place like that, do not appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, it turns out that the statistics, if you actually look at them, are that the Proto-Masoretic Torah is 48%. Proto-Samaritan 11. You can see these numbers. And when you look at these numbers, the biggest thing is what we call non-aligned. And it works that way for the prophets and writings. It means to say the Masoretic is the main text, and the other texts are effectively derivative from it. And that's the point which gets us to our question of interpretation. Just want to mention also that a lot of Bible texts were found at Masada and at the Bar Kokhba caves. They are all proto-Masoretic. So from a chronological point of view, the discussion of these variant Bibles that existed in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's a discussion of the period from about 200 and something BCE up through a little bit before the destruction of the temple. Once you're getting up close to the destruction of the temple in 70, once you're in the first century CE, all you have is proto-Masoretic Bible texts, and the Jewish people has taken that as the most authoritative type of text and the one they're going to use. Now, we have texts, for example, this Leviticus scroll, which are virtually letter for letter exactly the same as ours in the proto-Masoretic. But we also have some texts that have in them interpretations. And these texts that have in them interpretations have these little variations. And the little variations often are explaining the text. This, for example, is a Numbers manuscript. Now, you know that there are certain, everybody should know, that Deuteronomy repeats many of the things that's in the Torah before. Because Moses is giving a speech and he's telling his whole history. And imagine if you had to listen to that speech in one day. Talk about sermons that are too long, right? It sounds like he spoke all day for who knows for how many days, right? So anyhow, though, in Deuteronomy, he repeats a lot of stories. So imagine you have a numbers manuscript and you don't know all the details, but guess what? They're in Deuteronomy. So what do you do? You copy it in between the verses. That is one of the earliest forms of biblical interpretation that is shown in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is to add material from another book. Now, if you look at the so-called Samaritan Pentateuch, remember again, the Samaritans are those leftovers of the North Israelite exiles who stayed in the land. They exist, by the way, until today. There are some of them in Israel. The Samaritan Pentateuch does this all over the place. So if they're telling the story of the Exodus in the book of Exodus, they bring in details from Deuteronomy. If in Deuteronomy they have that quick summary that we read at the Haggadah, right? That they cried out unto our fathers and you heard their voice and you took them out of Egypt, etc., etc. You fill in the details there from the book of Exodus, which in case you forgot is what we do with the Haggadah. Because if you look at the Seder and the Haggadah, you'll see what we do is we quote a verse from Deuteronomy. We say, how do we know it's true? We quote the verse from Exodus. Next part of the verse in Deuteronomy, how do we know it's true? We quote the verse from Exodus. That is exactly what's going on in some of these manuscripts. On the other hand, you can have the great Isaiah scroll. This is in the rotunda at the shrine of the book. Unfortunately, it's the only piece of plastic that's there because the real text was rotting. They had to take it away. Everything else in the shrine of the book is a real Dead Sea scroll. Now, this Isaiah scroll is written into a whole different dialect of Hebrew. And so they've just rewritten the whole thing. It's, for example, if somebody would take, as we do every day actually, Shakespeare, and write it in modern English so the kids can read it in school. 
And that's what seems to have happened with Isaiah. We call that a vulgar text. Now, when you start to proceed a little bit further, you start to get, as an example of this book of Psalms, completely Masoretic texts. And they look, look exactly like what we expect. The text is the same as the one we have. And as we can see, we're proceeding towards having only our Bible here, just as an example from the book of Daniel, which is basically our Daniel. Now, before you can really talk about interpretation, so we've just talked about text. And what we've learned is that text and interpretation in the ancient Jewish manuscripts are not separate. Sometimes interpretation is literally inside what you call a biblical text. Now, by the way, that's true in our Bible, too, because there are texts like Chronicles that rewrite kings and, and judge, and write Sam, rewrite Samuel and kings and fill in information that's not there. They interpret. It's not a bad thing. It's not a fake. It makes the text understandable to us. But in any case, what you need to know is that when it comes to the Bible, we have to talk about text, then we have to talk about canon, what's in the collection. Because in the case of canon, since one of the most important things about biblical interpretation is that we interpret the Bible in light of its own self, so to speak. It's part, for us as Jews, of an overall set of concepts. So if I say to you, here always is the Lord of God, the Lord is one, and we're going to say, well, what do you mean by the Lord is one? Well, I'm going to immediately tell you, let's go look at what the prophets say. The prophets tell us we can't worship other gods. The prophets say they're phony, that they're not real. The prophets say that our God has real power. And so we go through, we use the Bible to understand the Bible. It's, by the way, not so clear to you today because these things we take as second nature. Because they're only second nature to us because we're living after certain interpretations became basic to Judaism. But the third ingredient, so to speak, or the second ingredient, I'm sorry, besides Bible and text, the other, besides, I'm sorry, besides text, the other ingredient that's important, I started early this morning, right, is canon, what's in the collection. Now here we have a scholarly debate. I have some colleagues who are convinced that there's an open canon at Qumran and anything can be in the Bible. Now, I personally believe that there's a limited number of texts, that they divide up, as we're used to, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and that there may have been a few extra books there, but that there is a closed collection. Why is this so important? Because if I have to determine what's a Bible text and what's an interpretation, I often have to know, is this part of the standard thing that we call the Bible? Because interpretations presume that there is a fixed text that they are going to interpret. And in the case of these Bible translations, so this is, or Bible commentaries, I have to understand that it doesn't think it's the Bible. So that's a very important question. Sometimes, by the way, to tell the truth, it's not what they think, it's what we think. So I don't know whether the author of Chronicles thought that he was writing Bible or interpreting earlier biblical texts. We consider Chronicles to be the Bible. I'm sure no one has read Chronicles. I don't know, it's a different question. I'm not going to ask people to raise their, raise their hand, right? But I'm sure no one has read Chronicles, but maybe some one person. But the bottom line is, these books that we have in our Bible, they are presumed by us to be in some way sanctified and holy. And we need to know in antiquity what they thought. From my opinion, there was such a thing, and there's evidence that certain works. But here I listed two works, Jubilees and the Aramaic Levy document, that may actually have been in the canon of the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians, because they quote them as if they're part of the biblical text. And one of the most important items here is this three-part thing. The MMT text, as we call it, 4Q MMT, which is that document which is so important for the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for the sect and who they are and how they separated and why. This document mentions the Torah and the words of the prophets, the, the book of Moses, the words of the prophets, and David, which I say that the prophets are the second group, and then David and the chronicles of each and every generation is what we call the writings. So from my point of view, there's the Torah, the, 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 uh, the prophets and the writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls as in our Bible. Now also, there are in the Dead Sea Scrolls certain books that we call Apocrypha. Now Apocrypha are books that got into the Greek Bible, but that may have been written too late to get into the Hebrew Bible, as we call it. And they got into the Greek Bible, and they are, until today, in the Catholic Bibles, even the Jewish texts. So i got to tell you, one and two Maccabees, we just finished Hanukkah. Would you believe this fat, funny fact, 
One and two Maccabees, the most important books for understanding the story of Hanukkah, are in the Catholic Bible, and they're not in the Jewish Bible. It's bizarre. Could you imagine if the Christmas story was in our Bible and not in theirs? That's what you're talking about. That is, is an accident, a funny accident of history, that the Apocrypha, this is the book of Tobit, which you may know from the Apocrypha, and this is a book called Enoch. Now we're getting to the point when sometimes a book could be written as if it's scripture, but it's really all interpretation. So you know that it says in the Torah about Enoch, Hanoch, that he was not because the Lord, because God took him up. Now, if anything says, please tell me a story, what do you mean he was not? God took him up. Imagine if you met one of your friends and they said, oh, you've seen uh, so-and-so lately. He said, oh, no, so-and-so, God took him up. So they would assume maybe he's dead. I don't know. But this guy was taken up. He had no grave, no nothing, right? So they began to speculate about him. And they speculated about him being in heaven and being one of God's assistants. And from this came forth a whole literature which seeks to explain the ways in which this Enoch functioned in heaven. And it tells us all kinds of things about the heavens and it tells us about astronomy, all kinds of information, the causes of evil in the world. It expands on all kinds of biblical stories in the process. And this begins to move us towards something that we call rewritten Bible, which is where the interpretation of the Bible is not just in a little gloss in the biblical text, but actually is in a retelling of additional stories, not in our Bible, but partly like our Bible. Now, another kind of interpretation that takes place is to sew together biblical texts. This is a photo of the earliest, they always say, Ten Commandments. When we had the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit, which was held in Times Square, I don't know if I should tell this joke, but people said to me that when I was in the movie, did you ever think you'd be in a movie playing in Times Square? <laughs> so anyhow, the, uh, when we had that exhibit at the uh, Discovery uh, Center, so what we uh, saw there was that during Christmas, New Year's period, they brought this piece. And you couldn't get into the building. It was absolutely impossible. There were people waiting an hour and a half just to see this because there are these Ten Commandments. But I got to tell you a little secret. It's not a Ten Commandments like the way you expect. You figure, let's get me the book of Exodus. Get me the book of Deuteronomy. I'll look up the Ten Commandments. It appears twice in the Torah. Great. Guess what? What's the biggest problem with the Ten Commandments? In the Ten Commandments, the first time it tells you you have to observe the Sabbath because God created the world in seven days. This is the whole idea. We say, again, we don't do labor. We recognize that God is the creator. And then, in Deuteronomy, it tells you, you have to keep the Sabbath for social reason, namely, of social meaning, social justice reason, that you have to remember you were slaves in Egypt, and you have to give the opportunity to everyone else to rest. Yourself, your family, your animals, your employees, your slaves, whatever it is, you have to give them all to rest. You know what these guys did? They smushed them together and made one text. Remember the Sabbath because in seven days God created and you were slaves in Egypt. Now, the point I want to make about this is that's not the only thing they did here. Because they took Deuteronomy 8, which requires you to say grace after meals and you should eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord your God. And they put it on a little piece with the Shema in some kind of excerpt. Now, I can't tell you why somebody wanted these particular passages in his could be her even, pocket. But this is interpretation. Because someone has said these are important passages and the decision that the two versions of the Ten Commandments are one is something we say every Friday night in L'chad Odi. We say, Zachor b'shamor b'dibor echad. That the two versions of the Ten Commandments, the one that says remember and the one that says, says, says be careful, these are the two versions that we're talking about, were said at once by God. Now, how that happened, the Midrash tries to explain some miracle. But what, it's, what that's telling us is that the Ten Commandments are speaking about the same Sabbath and both meanings are really to be understood together. Because in others, we understand that because God is the creator is why we have obligations to other people. We're all created by the same God, etc. We understand all those concepts. I don't have to explain that here. But the point is, by putting them together this way, it represents a fundamentally important interpretation. And here you could read the text, which I probably should have shown you earlier, but you can see how it works. God took you out of Egypt without such damn. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe. For in six days God made the two of them together. Where else are they together? Friday night Kiddush. Look carefully at the Friday Night Kiddush. You'll see it's exactly that. God created it, and he took you out of Egypt. It's about, he created the world in remembrance of Egypt. Now, this is a scroll of the Psalms. And this scroll of the Psalms has all kinds of really interesting things in it. 
And one of the things that it has is a discussion of the nature of David's divine inspiration when he composed Psalms. And actually, they discussed a whole lot of different texts that could have been written by David here, but the key point is all these he spoke through prophecy. Because the concept of the Bible is that the Bible has some kind of divine inspiration, the Torah being big divine inspiration, the prophets being a little less, and the writings being, again, even less, the descending order of inspiration. And there were those people in the Qumran sectarian group who were convinced that some modicum of prophecy remained even with them and their leadership. And that's something about certain Second Temple texts that differs from the way the rabbis understood this matter, because as far as they were concerned, prophecy had ended. Now, interpretation in the scrolls comes in a whole variety of texts, therefore. First of all, translations. We have Aramaic translations, what we call Targum. We have pieces of the Septuagint, because apparently some Greek-speaking Jews hung out at Qumran where they found the scrolls, or must have been there at some point, left some fragments. Then we have simple sense commentary, which is like what you would expect if you open a Bible commentary in a synagogue. And then we have the retellings. Now the question is, why did the rabbis object to a lot of this stuff? So they objected to the retelling of the Bible, because in the retellings, Human things are basically put over as if they're divine. Because what it means is this. If I take the story of Moses and I decide to add my own details, I've taken something that the Jewish tradition understands to be given by God, and I put in my own words, my own ideas. So this was considered to be inappropriate by the rabbis of the Talmud. But these Second Temple Jews were doing it all the time. And furthermore, there's another type of interpretation called harmonization. It can be a textual harmonization. So one place says that you shall do good in the eyes of the Lord. And another place says something about good and upright. So you add the two together and you get a verse, thou shalt do good and be upright in the eyes of the Lord. And now you've expanded a text and made a new interpretation. Then we have harmonization of Jewish law, we call halachic. That happens in the scrolls when you see this in some examples, somebody wanted to make a holiday. You know, we have a new year on what we could call 7-1. That is to say, the first of Tishrei, which is our Rosh Hashanah, the seventh month of the year, but Nisan is the first. There's a scroll called the Temple Scroll, which rewrites much of the Torah, and they decided they want to have a new year on Nisan 1. Nisan 1 is what you could call 1-1, one, one, because the Torah tells us that Nisan is the first in the counting of the months. So how do you get the information for sacrifices to be done on 1-1, one, one, if you have a 7-1 New Year, I hope everyone understands these numbers, 1-1 one, one and 7-1, right? Not January 1st, right? 1-1 one, one means Nisan 1 in the spring, and in the, in the fall, Tishrei 1, which is our Rosh Hashanah. Anyhow, what you do is you take the, the sacrifices the Torah requires on Rosh Hashanah, and you slap them to two weeks before Pesach, and you put them down in Nisan on the first day, as we called it before, 1-1. One, one. And now you harmonize the two days. You harmonize the beginning of the first half of the year, for which we had no Torah rules, with the beginning of the second half of the year. And that's a form of biblical interpretation. And I just point out that some of these methods were followed, despite rabbinic objection, by the medieval Karaites, the sect of literalist Jews who got some ideas somehow from some of these uh, sectarian groups that we saw before. Now, this is a piece of what we call simple sense interpretation. Because if you look this at this text, he wants to add, answer a very simple form, very simple question. Because Ham was involved in this business of covering or uncovering of Noah when he was drunk after the flood. Nobody really knows what this story means. There are all kinds of interpretations. But Noah curses his son, Ham. Well, he actually doesn't. He curses Canaan, who's the son of Ham, right after he wakes up and finds out what happened. And look what happens over there, right? So it says in that text that he didn't curse him because God had blessed the sons of Noah. Once God blessed you, there's nothing you can do about it. So instead of blessing, instead of cursing the guy who made trouble for him, he instead curses his son. Now, you could say you don't like that interpretation. Frankly, that's not what we're talking about. I may not like it either. But it's an attempt to give a simple interpretation for why the Torah says what it says. And this other thing having to do with the question of why was Jacob 
reproving Reuven, and it doesn't exactly say what he does. It's all he says to him that he's that he's he's quick to do things, and you know this kind of stuff, and he he gets excited quickly, and the things are not clear what he's talking about. So actually, answer is as he says over here. The interpretation is that he Jacob reproved him, Reuben, because he had sexual relations with Bilhah, his Jacob's concubine. Now that's an interpretation that is found in a lot of rabbinic sources at all. Also. However, the point I'm making is that we have such interpretations in the scrolls, biblical interpretation. Now, this is a very interesting book. It's called the Genesis Apocryphon. If we had the whole book, it was a retelling in Aramaic of much of the book of, of uh, Genesis. Unfortunately, a lot of it rotted or for some reason it was not preserved. But we want to take a look at one interesting story. Everybody wants to know how could Abraham lie about his wife. Just imagine this, if you're introduced to someone and this woman is the guy's wife and he says, oh, this is my, this is my, this is my sister, right? And just imagine this, so bizarre, right? And he did this and in the end it had exactly the, the effect, I guess, the worst possible effect you could expect that uh, somebody decides to be interested in her and you can't even blame him. Does he know that, he's ma- that, that she's a married woman? He hit it and said it was his sister. So why would he do such a nutty thing? Answer, God came to him in a dream and told him to do it. And you can quickly look at this. And the point is that God told him, listen, you have to protect yourself because there are people who are going to want, now this is the irony, seek to kill me and spare you. In the end, that's what almost happened because of his actions. But nonetheless, the text wants to say that God actually gave this inspiration. So here you have the typical example of the rewriting of a story in the Torah to answer the questions that the Torah leaves you. This is the kind of work, by the way, which Professor Kugel does so much of, that he works a lot with these questions of, as they call them often, interstices in the text. But that's what the Genesis Apocryphon is doing here. Now, another type of interpretation is halachic Jewish law midrash, which we have, and it relates very carefully to rabbinic literature, And you have to understand that this form of interpretation is based often on a concept that they have in the scrolls of a revealed and a hidden law. The revealed law is the text. Anybody can read and say what it means. The hidden is the sectarian tradition, which is passed on only to those who are the initiates in this sectarian group, which, as you know, many scholars identified with the Essenes. I've had some question about that. I've tried to show that they originate with the sect of the Sadducees, but it doesn't really matter for what we're talking about tonight. We're, we're talking about how they interpret the, the, the Bible. And, of course, as I noted, the idea of two Torahs are revealed and a hidden is similar in certain ways to the rabbinic oral law and the written law and the oral law, which, of course, is a major part of Judaism. The sectarians also believe in continuous revelation. Peshar is a very particular type of interpretation in which the Bible, specifically, by the way, the, the 12 minor prophets, Isaiah and Psalms, from what we have, are interpreted as contemporizing. So you read them as if they're not speaking about the time of the ancient prophets. They're speaking about us today. And that interpretation in the Dead Sea Scrolls has given us a lot of historical information because they tell through the mouths of the prophets sometimes their own story. And so you can see in this example from the rule of the community, this is the interpretation of the Torah which he, God, commanded through Moses to observe according to everything that's revealed from time to time. The sectarians get these revelations over time. And according to the words of the prophets and what they have told us, by his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy. So what happens is that they believe, basically, that there's an ongoing process of revelation which isn't going to stop. Now, this is actually my favorite scroll, the Temple Scroll. I have published already two books on this scroll. They always call it, of course, about over $200 for one volume, unlike the three volumes we're talking about here. For one volume, these are very, it's, a, it's a phenomenal scroll. It's a rewrite of the entire Torah from the end of Exodus, the entire Torah, most of the Torah from the end of Exodus, through the middle of Deuteronomy, all the legal material. But it's all organized about sacrifice and temple and worship, but there's a lot of other interesting stuff. And here's the idea. Your laws are stated in the style of the Bible. The author is speaking in God's name. Now, this is sort of if someone took the Mishnah and wanted to rewrite the Torah. So when it said, right, and you shall love the Lord your God, etc., and then it said you shall speak of them when you get up, it would add, and read the three paragraphs, Hero Israel. You see what I'm saying? That's what's happening in this scroll. They're writing laws into the text 
often by using midrashic interpretation, harmonization, etc. So I gave you this example. This is the one we discussed before. And it's the example of having a sacrifice for the extra New Year festival on the 1st of Nisan. Now, the, another really interesting place to find out about biblical interpretation is a document that's called by two names, Damascus document or Tzadokite fragments. Let's skip why they have two names. Many scrolls have two names. It's a kind of a problem. But in any case, this document was first found, and you actually see it here, in a manuscript in the Cairo Geniza in the 1890s by Solomon Schechter, and it was published in 1911 because the first Dead Sea Scroll was actually found in the Cairo Geniza, and later on, 10 manuscripts of this document were found with the scrolls. And I want to take you through an amazingly complex example of halachic Jewish law interpretation, which does, I'd say, let's put it this way, it would make anybody proud in the times of the Mishnah and Gomorrah. As to that which he, God, said, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinfolk. That's a commandment in the Torah. So we want to fulfill that. So what does it refer to? Any man from among those who have entered the covenant, that means the sectarians, you have to know these people believe that all who matter are in their group. It's another discussion, but they don't have our concepts of Jewish unity. Forget about what you read in the Jewish newspapers. I mean, these guys, they, they no, no Jewish newspaper reports about non-unity in the Jewish community could ever compete with the attitude of these people to outsiders. I mean, that's really the truth. They believe the Messianic era is only for them. Everybody else is not really the true Israel. It's a very negative concept. But nonetheless, let's go with their interpretation. So any, any man who entered the covenant means those guys. Who shall bring a charge against his neighbor which is not with reproof before witnesses? Now you have to know, they have a law. Let's say you see someone doing a violation of the law. You must come with witnesses, two witnesses, and reprove him before the sectarian official. Only if a person is reproved in that manner can he later be convicted of a crime. Now it goes on. If he does that without reproof and now accuses him of another violation, he's taking vengeance and bearing a grudge. Now, how do we know you're not allowed to take a vengeance and bear a grudge? Because is it not written only in the book of Nechem? He, God, takes vengeance and bears a grudge. You're not allowed to do it. But what happens if the guy kept silent about him, meaning he saw somebody violate the law and he didn't do anything? He didn't do reproof in front of the re thing, and now he comes and he accuses him anyhow? His, the accused, guilt is upon him. In other words, you accuse a guy of committing crime X. Then it's as if you did it, because you should have reproved him the first time. And that's why he's doing it now. So therefore, he did not fulfill the commandment of God. What do you mean? If I don't reprove the person who violated the law, what commandment did I not fulfill? It's the commandment that says over here, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you bear guilt because of him. Now, in rabbinic tradition, we have all kinds of problems about how do you reprove a person, and should you reprove a person, and what happens if they're not going to listen, they're going to do the opposite thing, and where do we not worry about that, because the guy's doing something that's so terrible, and somebody's about to shoot someone, we don't sit around and discuss whether we should reprove them, right? Okay, however, here's what you have to understand. The whole reproof process in the Qumran Jewish law system is designed to solve a problem that the rabbis also had. How do we know someone's an intentional violator of a crime? The answer is we have to say in rabbinic tradition that we're warning you before you do it. And unless the person, let's say a person commits murder, unless two witnesses say to him, do you know that if you do this crime, the punishment is death? Unless he then says, yes, I know, before he does the murder, you can't convict him of a capital offense. Now that's astounding, but they require absolute certainty before an execution would take place, which is why the rabbi said any court that executed anybody is a bloody court. So what you can see here is they had the same problem. How can we be totally certain that the person understands the crime and knows what he's doing? The answer they give is we'll reprove him from a previous violation of the same crime. And without that reproof, if you accuse him, it's as if you're guilty. Why? Had you accused him the first time, he would have understood he shouldn't be doing this. But what I'm quoting this for you is not to understand the details that I just gave you, which I hope everyone followed, is to show you the detailed interpretation of halakhic Jewish law matters, which is, as they say, would make any rabbi proud. So now we want to talk a little bit about this Pesher interpretation. First of all, it comes in different forms. It can be continuous, like a pesher on the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, it just goes verse, 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 like that, like what you used to, Bible commentary. 
Sometimes we have anthology. Sometimes a little pesher is put into something else. Remember, pesher is a contemporizing interpretation that understands the text as if it's talking about now. Now, also, there's a theology to this because apparently they believe that the prophet's words are really relevant to today, not to the time of the prophets. Now, I have to explain how that differs from regular Judaism. Because you go to synagogue and they read the Haftorah. And maybe even in the sermon they mention it. And basically the message is these things are relevant to us. So let's take an obvious case. If the Haftorah says that people are mistreating the poor, and you read it, you're supposed to know we're not supposed to mistreat the poor. That's what we mean by relevant to us. But we're not supposed to assume what they assume, that it's not talking to someone in the 8th century BCE, and that the prophecy could not be understood until it was interpreted by our teacher, called by the sectarians, teacher of righteousness. And that it has no relevance to the past, it's only relevant to me today. That's what they believed. We never take a verse out of its original context and would ever understand, no matter what great sermon the rabbi is about to give, based on his text, no matter how meaningful the message may be to us in whether a general situation as part of a larger community or as individuals, we never take away. And we certainly don't believe that you need an intermediary of another divinely inspired figure to tell you what Isaiah means. And that's what they believed. That's the two-step prophecy with the